All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the mid to late October installment of Grand Rounds and conference this morning. Uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Manigas. Uh, Chris is, uh, is a product of the UW training program. Uh, Chris started off uh, back in the college days at University of Illinois. Um, and a real known trivia fact, the, uh, the Illini is one of the few Division I college mascots that is uh, not an animal, not a color, and does not end in S. There are uh, <laughs> other ones that, uh, that we can think about throughout the morning while Chris is talking to us about, uh, about Holeps. Uh, but following the U of I, Chris uh, did his medical school training at University of Indiana, which uh, that may be a theme this morning with our, our speakers, as we'll find out in about 45 minutes. And following that, he joined our program um, as a resident and completed training here in around 2010. Uh, following that, he joined the uh, the community here in Dane County at Fort Atkinson, taking care of patients uh, for uh, urology work. And a few years ago, joined our department as an assistant professor on the CHS track. And in addition to his uh, work in general urology, uh, he and Dr. Brownick, who we heard from last week, have uh, really spearheaded the whole lab program here. Uh, Chris also wears the hat of being a UW Health uh, Informacist and our department representative within the healthcare system for this. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn the, uh, the floor over to you, uh, Dr. Mankis. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate the introduction. Um, and I'm sharing my screen. Can everyone see full screen PowerPoint and my floating head? Yeah. Looking good. All right. Thanks so much. So we're going to, um, we'll get right to it. We've got a full morning. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to speak to the group. And I want to quick mention a disclosure about grant support from Luminous for education. I will uh, uh, start off here with a summary of what we're going to talk about. We'll quickly get into why is Holep worth learning and is it hard to learn? We'll talk about the anatomy and the equipment specific to the procedure, the technique. There'll be a little video that hopefully streams through. And finally, how we've learned to teach this. So, Holup, Holmium Laser Nucleation of the Prostate, uh, was first described in 1998 by Fraundorfer and Gilling, a, a group out of New Zealand. And it really is a unique approach to BPH operative intervention. This is a minimally invasive natural orifice, endoscopic, simple prostatectomy. You're enucleating the transition zone away from the peripheral zone, a technique familiar to many urologists that trained long ago as a simple prostatectomy that used to require a low midline incision and now is done robotically. But in the open days, we had a transfusion rate, uh, depending on the paper here, as much as 10%, uh, two to three day hospital stay and real challenges around patients as they've increasingly been on anticoagulation. Uh, whole up's very different. It's outpatient. It is uh, uh, a very low transfusion rate and patients um, quickly get rid of their catheter. So less morbidity and uh, improved technique. The whole up uh, guidelines, excuse me, the BPH guidelines just revised here in 2021 actually include HOLEP as a treatment that's appropriate for any size prostate, um, anywhere from small, average to large and very large. And it's really unique in the guidelines as far as uh, procedures that uh, are endorsed for those different interventions. HOLEP's also in the guidelines as felt to be appropriate for patients who are medically complex that require anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy. This is with PVP and Thulip as specific procedures that should be considered in these circumstances. HOLEP also seems to have improved outcomes for restoring spontaneous voiding. In this prospective study, 95% of men with an acontractile bladder were able to void after HOLEP. Now that is with about 20% of them using Valsalva. HOLEP is durable. The retreatment rate for HOLEP is low relative to other procedures. And this study was a, um, examined the rate of retreatment in seven year follow up with TERP approximating 17%, HOLEP close to zero. Similar numbers for a randomized comparison, although only with three year follow up, PVP, bipolar TERP, and HOLEP. And you're looking at um, 
uh, excellent retreatment rate for whole lead. I did come across this recently, as many of you did, I'm sure. Dr. McVeary um, and his group published a meta analysis on prostate urethral lift over 2,000 patients, looking at a reoperation rate of 28.9% in five years. A whole up was durable. And, and we have uh, increasing evidence uh, that proves an excellent safety profile, excellent outcomes. And um, we are looking at HOLEP as a new gold standard for endoscopic management of BPH. So why isn't HOLEP performed more often? Now, you'd never say that if you saw our numbers for HOLEP, but UW has only been doing this for the last four years. And yes, we do a lot of them here, but that's simply not the case everywhere. Only about 5% of all BPH procedures are HOLEP. And uh, this is, uh, the graph is actually from a different study that looks at Australian data showing in the teal band there, just how small of overall percentage of BPH procedures are whole up. So why is that? Why is not, why is whole up not done more? Well, if there's anything anybody knows about whole up, it's that there's a narrative about how difficult it may be to learn. Uh, and this um, 30 to 50 case learning curve is uh, from a review paper that examined many other papers uh, that published on just how hard it was to adapt to this technique, whether you're a novice surgeon, an experienced surgeon, and it really sits around 30 to 50. Now that that 50 is potentially longer if you're really spreading your cases out and you've got one hole up every three months, it's difficult to get momentum for improvement. Um, and uh, though 30 seems to be it for a nice compressed learning curve. And how does this compare to other surgeries? Uh, review paper uh, looking at robotic prostatectomy at about 40 cases, robotic assisted cystectomy at 16 to 30, and PCNL at 12 to 60. So there's, in addition to this learning curve, there's other barriers to learning whole up. Um, but really it's, um, a lot of it is the limited access to training. There's only so many fellowships available to uh, get a focused uh, high volume experience. And interestingly, there was uh, a study and I, I don't know why the quote didn't come through there, but in the um, even fellows, there's only about, 60% of fellows that finish their fellowship um, go on to, to perform whole up in the in their place of practice. Residency is even more limited. And as Dr. Gronlick and myself have uh, networked with other uh, endoscopists doing whole up, it really is ex an extremely limited number of residents that are finishing their training ready for whole up. Plus, the vast majority of us are not in residency or fellowship anymore, and the self-taught whole leper is out there, but it definitely takes a leap because of some procedure-specific equipment, like the laser and, of course, the morselator, that uh, it's a, a pretty big ask of any hospital to make the investment if you don't have these pieces of equipment for something that you might not be able to finish your learning curve on. Um, then there's the question of economics, which is if you really uh, dive into the ref reflex reaction on the long learning curve, it's that it's going to take a long time to learn. And time is income for a lot, of, a lot of urologists in practice. And if you can do a green light or a TERP and you've got great outcomes, um, what incentive is there for you to take um, several cases, 30, 40, 50 cases that might start off by taking three or four hours when you could be doing other things. And there really isn't a, a, a significant difference in the reimbursement between OLA, green light, and, and TERP. And so there's important considerations as you're moving through this um, decision is whether or not to adapt, whether or not to adapt to HOLEP. But how did I learn? Obviously, I didn't do a fellowship. I didn't go to residency in a place where they did HOLEP. And I point out here just a big thanks to Dr. Gronlick's mentorship. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you about learning and teaching whole up if it wasn't for uh, Dan saying, sure, come on down, let's do some. And it was, uh, 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 it, it has become the most uh, rewarding uh, surgical education experience in my career, uh, being able to, to work with Dan to develop this program. And I'm just really grateful for that opportunity. So after I, 
watched a few with Dan, went down to witness four cases with Dr. Cranbeck, who's a prolific uh, hole-up surgeon, was at Indiana then, now at Northwestern. I did that in November of 18, about three years ago, did my first hole-up on my own in January, a few months later. And all along the way, though, we knew we needed to grow the program. And so we had been working with Meritor's administration for several months to get the equipment procured and everything through finance so that we had a new laser, new scopes, new morse later, and three pans of everything to get ready to go. So we did 30, I did 30 cases in five months, 50 cases in nine months, eventually 100 hole ups by February of 20, and we'll be going, I'll be going past uh, 500, and I think the department will go through 1,000 pretty soon here. So what's a good hole up outcome? A lot of the studies that look at learning curve will, will comment on exactly these points, but did you finish? And I think importantly here, did finishing it break you? <laughs> There's a fascinating paper out of France that was just what the emotional and psychological toll of doing this procedure um, was on the surgeon. Uh, so don't let it break you if you're struggling and you're into hour four, don't hesitate to convert to something like a, a TERP or PVP. Um, you know, there's, uh, I think um, one of our former residents was joking about how, you know, some folks saying they're doing hole up are really like hole lurping where they'll start off and then they get frustrated and finish with the turp more often than not. You just do, you got to do it safe and, and really it does uh, increasingly there's a focus on time in this in, in hole up. There's a few papers here that look at the longer the procedure. Um, the greater the risk to the patient because of this uh, prolonged post-op incontinence and potential um, a permanent negative effect on incontinence. If you're taking truly forever, you know, four, five, six hours for small glands that, um, uh, you know, you, you're lost. And so you are, it's felt that you're just mashing on the sphincter or doing other damage because you don't know where you are. A motto I have with the residents is just be safe and don't be slow, you know, find ways to improve that efficiency and uh, make that a priority um, along with developing the best possible technique. And along those lines, you know, when I actually, I remember sitting there with uh, Amy Cranbeck and, you know, what would you do if you were starting a new, a whole program de novo? What kind of information would you start to collect? And she said, nucleation time, morselation time, wait. And she um, puts this on a whiteboard in her OR and they weigh the specimen in that OR. And I, I started doing that as soon as I came back from that, that uh, preceptorship. And it, it's, I think it's a motivator and it's great instant gratification for both myself and the residents that when we're doing this case, you instantly track on, well, you know, that was hard, but it only took us 35 minutes or that one was really, really easy. And it, it, it felt like it, and we got a great weight out. And so you're, you're, you're talking about that. You're debriefing as you go through this and you have this data front and center to say, yeah, this is how much we got out. This is how long it took us. What did we learn and what can we do differently? Um, I, this goes back to some, um, <laughs> leadership, uh, conferences I went to years ago, but it comes down to measurement driving improvement. You don't know if you're, if you're getting better, uh, unless you actually measure. So I'd like to shift into talking about um, learning the procedure and an emphasis on anatomy. Um, it might seem silly and common sense, but quite frankly, uh, BPH imaging and anatomy um, is behind a lot of other stuff that we learned in residency. I vividly remember Moon saying uh, over my ear, in the VA, like Dr. Monica sits a barrel shaped organ treated as such. And I, I didn't know what that meant, uh, mostly because I didn't understand the accent uh, at times because he was pretty angry sometimes, but he, he was, he was right. in that it was, it, it was often, you know, fatter in the middle, but we've come to understand certainly in as much imaging as we're getting leading into whole of that these, the, the, the prostate size and shape is incredibly heterogeneous. You have, um, uh, multi-nodular prostates, anterior, posterior, predominant, left is bigger than the right. You've got post-terp, post-green light patients where there's wild asymmetry. And then, of course, just, you know, what, what's that medium lobe and how's that going to affect your surgical approach? Um, I really, um, 
emphasize the need to image these people beforehand, especially when you have a sense that something is big. All right. Now, it's one thing if you've got a guy and you've done a cysto and it seems pretty small and he's in acute retention. Well, this is probably the best option for him. But beyond those those really straightforward situations, more information is better than less, especially as you're trying to understand the procedure so you can be as ready as possible um, uh, to um, uh, plan those surgical steps. I, I realize that now we've got a fluent language, but every time I get a new uh, third year resident at Meritor, I have to stop myself to um, uh, uh, translate some of the language we've come to use to describe 3D location. This is a really disorienting procedure and you have to be fluent in your ability to quickly to say base, mid, apex, posterior, anterior, bladder, neck, sphincter, what all that means, where you sit with the scope in relation to those structures and orientations. Here's a couple great examples of imaging of uh, two holdups that happened to be back to back about a month ago. This is a patient on the left, it's an MRI. You see the catheter sitting in the, uh, in the urethra with a massive median lobe. MRI measures this to be about 160 milliliters and then just the next procedure, you see a CT on this side, but previous TERP, and so somebody definitely spent some time doing the posterior work, but look at all of that residual anterior tissue. So um, uh, different approaches, and certainly as you're trying to make that turn into the anterior plane, it's going to behave differently for the second procedure versus the first procedure. I want to uh, give a shout out here to the radius uh, group, the radius service that the Department of Radiology offers. And uh, next I'm going to talk about some 3D modeling that they helped us create uh, using MRI. And this first patient is a 59 year old male. Uh, he didn't actually have a hole up. This is our proof of concept 3D model that the goal was to 3D print something for both patient and residents and medical school education. And as a side benefit, we got these great digital versions of the 3D model that I'll pull up now. Assuming the link works. Give me just a second. I thought logging in this morning would help. There it is. So this is, what are we looking at? We have a, um, a movable 3D model of a prostate and the bottom of the bladder that um, we did uh, print into a plastic model that comes together like puzzle pieces. And um, the blue here is the peripheral zone and the software does allow you to drop this out and show you that there is um, uh, a few other pieces we can the, the red is the anterior fibromuscular stroma you've got the central zone posterior this is the transition zone you can make the bladder go away so this is what we're nucleating away and i want to point out here that um even in a small gland look at where that prostatic urethra is relative to that giant uh predominant anterior tissue this is uh, another highlight here is get a look at that confluence of the ejaculatory ducts the vira montanum and just how mid gland that really sits and so if you're using what i used which was a viru when i was doing terp the viru was the distal landmark and if you're doing that you're really leaving a lot of tissue behind and so is that why some of these patients who are in retention do better with terp or excuse me do better with hole up than terp because you're really getting everything out when you enucleate all of this away and so if you do a hole up um this is what you have left uh, in the end, it is a wide open channel. Um, let me get back to the PowerPoint. And then another one, different case. This was a, uh, another example of a whole up patient, actually, that we uh, we did a, oh, probably six months, maybe nine months ago. 80-year-old guy, massive retention, MRI measured 133 milliliters, and um, he had a 90 milliliter transition zone measured. Look at that median lobe, and what I'll do here is pull up the uh, 3D model of his prostate that we had printed. Uh, 
I'm especially fond of the demonstration of that um, uh, of his prosthetic urethra. He will drop out the peripheral zone, central zone, and the anterior fibromuscular stroma. We'll come down to now. If you were doing a terp, and I definitely would have fallen into this category, you go through, you do that median lobe on this guy, and you are patting yourself on the back about job well done because you probably took care of his problem. But look at how much anterior tissue there, and you're you're never going to know this if you do a truss. Um, you're not going to know this, and honestly, who's going to trust this guy? Well, I certainly didn't include a lot of it pre surgical imaging before I started doing whole up. And I think you don't know if you don't look. And and that's that's a big takeaway for me as we've built this whole up program is that imaging is a, a very helpful adjunct as you try to understand the anatomy and try to be successful with learning the procedure. One last case that um, I want to show really just because it's a monster. Uh, and those are fun, but this guy came in, he's only 55. 10 years of symptoms, 322 milliliter prostate, 247 milliliter transition zone. We got 228 out. And his model is, um, again, going to demonstrate that we have a massive bulk of anterior tissue. So as anybody out there that's whole upping, just imagine kind of making that turn uh, around the uh, 9, to 10, 9, to 12, 9 to noon when you've got this much anterior tissue. Again, again, example of where the viru sits relative to the rest of the gland. If you're only going to, well, you shouldn't really do a terp on a 300 gram prostate, but if you're going to only come uh, proximal to that, look how much you're leaving behind. So this is just photographs of the 3D printed models that we made. Uh, this was the median lobe guy, and they are um, something that I will use to patients who um, have uh, uh, representative anatomy or questions about the procedure. Uh, moving on to the equipment, this is the back table uh, at Meritor. We've got a stores continuous flow laser scope setup and um, a Wolf Piranha Morse later here and UW. But, you know, it's a quick uh, dilation of the meatus uh, after some light a jet. And I strongly encourage residents to spend some time as they first join at, on taking these apart and putting them back together almost like your Forrest Gump trying to take the gun apart and putting it back together because you can't do this. You, you really, uh, there's three different spinning levers on these stores scopes. And when you're rotating around the, the adenoma, um, it's not uncommon to, you know, put your hand in just the wrong place. And next thing you know, scopes falling apart, you've got fluid leaking everywhere and you wonder why you can't see. So, um, it's part of the early learning curve is just the equipment. And of course, the morselator, uh, quoting, um, our chairman, it's good. It's not great. The, um, uh, handpiece can fail on you. And I've just got a list here of all the things that, We've got to be sure of as we are struggling, if we are struggling, and it's not really if, it's when something clogs up the tubing, the power cable might not be collected, uh, connected completely, the on-off switch might be partially open, the O-ring might be gone, no shortage of things, just kind of systematically try to troubleshoot, and then all else fails, we can blame anesthesia. Technique, now, all right, bear with me as I just jump out of the PowerPoint and um, I've got a video to show you and my, I'm sitting at a super fast internet connection. My apologies if there's any issues with frame rate on your end. And I'll warn you if you are, uh, in any way, uh, motion sick, I had a buddy take a look at it and he, uh, recommended a scopolamine patch, but, uh, uh just make the image smaller and I think everything will be better. We're going to start off. Um, and I'm going to narrate through about a 12-minute uh, uh, version of a whole lab. So this is for everybody out there um, get a sense of what we're really doing. I put this together with iMovie, had some fun with the soundtrack uh, coming up on. Uh, for those of the residents that have uh, been with me in the OR, I will often torture you with some fish. And that's what we're going to do for this, just to make sure you really feel like it's a complete experience. Um, so we've started, we're making our incisions lateral to the viru, referred to as an omega incision, because once you do this quick sweep, 
down to the capsule to expose the uh, plane that we will strive to maintain. It kind of will make an omega shape. Um, the uh, video here is sped up just a little bit so I can get the whole thing in in the, con in the presentation. But in a moment here, I'm going to pop in an MRI image to show you exactly where we are while we do the whole lab. This is sagittal view. We're going to be coming up underneath the adenoma, between the adenoma and the capsule. You're going to spend some time here with the laser pointed against the specimen, moving side to side, and you get a sense that a couple highlights. I'm not stopping to dry things up here. You get close enough and the flow gets a little bleeders away. You stay close to the specimen, close to the specimen, close to the specimen. That's what I tell the residents. As you come uh, up the back side of the adenoma, it is very, very easy to get thin. And so this is not a place where prolific, frustrated sweeping will get you anywhere. This is a purely laser dissection as you come side to side, back towards the bladder neck, but under the adenoma. Eventually, we will be switching to a six o'clock incision that will go from the bladder neck down to this space, functionally cutting the posterior adenoma in half. Here's that six o'clock and it's going to, um, it, it's one of the actually hardest parts to, uh, I have found the hardest parts to learn the trainees because they don't know how to scope the tissue response to the laser yet. They, this takes a lot of, at times, uh, uncomfortable closeness to the tissue to really get it done efficiently. So I actually wind up having them do this last in the stepwise approach. Um, and uh, that way they get the most out of their time. It's something that we'll talk about later is that, you know, they, we, when I do these, it's two or three in a day, plus a few other cases. And the residents know that they're not going to get a chance to do the whole thing every time. And so it's like, you get half an hour, you get 40 minutes, and this is, and what do you want, how do you want to spend that time? And we, we talk about what the day is going to be like, and we make sure they get an opportunity to get some scope time in a way that is appropriate for their level of experience and training. So we're developing this posterior channel. This is something that you don't want to dig a tunnel. You want to lift off those medial edges from the posterior capsule. And uh, one of the things I demonstrated here was that if you get, uh, try to get too quick with your um, bottom up incision, you can actually create parallel planes and then need to connect the space. Uh, that's much more difficult in a bigger gland. Uh, this one is about a 90 milliliter prostate, um, no median lobe. Here we're gonna be shifting to a, a posterior lateral dissection. This is coming from medial, back to lateral, back to medial, side to side, from six to nine o'clock. Uh, uh, definitely spend plenty of time uh, lifting this off the posterior cap. The more that this is mobilized, the more successful we are likely to be turning into the lateral uh, approach. So speaking of the lateral approach, we come in towards the mid gland and the X and see where that normal wants to peel, you'll see a lot of lasering and then nudging scope to kind of show where it wants to naturally peel. I balance the sweeping with the laser because the laser is just more hemostatic. Again, I'm not stopping to cauterize as we know because uh, the sweeping is strategic. So we're getting ready to turn into the anterior plane in just a minute or two. This is one of the hardest parts to really master. You are uh, constantly having to advance the scope and demonstrate where that perfect plane is to yourself uh, without getting too wide. You can see glimmers of fat there. And what I'm doing is a quick course correction to get closer to the adenoma, force my way in there. Uh, of course, it's a gentle course, but you gotta show yourself where that peel point is so you can stay in the perfect subcapsular plane. Eventually, you start to see things peeling and you get little nudges. And you get into this shiny uh, anterior capsular space that is a, a, a rewarding moment. And the residents know I get excited. Uh, I get excited a lot, which is a lot of the time, especially here. 
they can come there on top of the end here at no it's, That's the hardest part of the case. They can do it. Now, it takes a little time to get to it. They, um, so we're just coming around the top. This is uh, uh, one of the things I forgot to mention on the 3D modeling that we did is you saw that peripheral zone. You saw the big lands. That uh, the peripheral zone didn't seem to extend much beyond mid land towards the bladder neck. Um, you need to uh, keep that in mind as you're trying to turn because it's the thinnest part of the capsule there between mid gland and bladder neck. What we did just there was pump, uh, uh, push into the bladder, uh, punching through at 12 o'clock. It's kind of what that's referred to. Really disorienting when you do that. It's black and you're like, oh no, am I supposed to see black? No. In, other, in every other endoscopic situation, if you see a big dark place, it's very scary. Uh, not here. That's a rewarding moment when uh, I encourage you to just make sure, hey, where are those ureteral orifices relative to where we're dissecting this off? And we're going to take a moment there here to um, just confirm that the UOs are falling away because as you come through, uh, anteriorly, you can actually be really, really close to the trigone, and uh, I like to mark the UOs, and the residents sometimes think they get too close to them. Um, we're coming around. This is a great jam, by the way. I hope you're enjoying this. Um, Seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, fish from Halloween in 1995. Actually, my first show coming up on my fish anniversary. I don't know if Williams is still listening. So we come up to the top and got to 12 to 3 o'clock to thin out this anterior apex. This is going to help you uh, with your 12 o'clock dissection that uh, um, is necessary and if you're going to flip it. Uh, this particular developing the anterior space makes it so that there is as little tissue at the mid gland and apex as possible. The um, uh, 12 o'clock incision will uh, get you a chance to cut it in half and you know there's talk about unlock or not and the I found that if you try to keep this intact and on um, for the entire nucleation that it just is too disorienting for the learners and I honestly don't know what the upside is I mean besides saying you can do it I've done it several times and I, I don't know that it helps any time. Depends on the size of the gland. Medium lobe is just impossible to keep on block. Here we're, we're um, uh, finishing that anterior uh, 12 o'clock dissection. We've released the apex. We're spinning around, making everybody nauseated on the video. And uh, eventually we'll be finished with that anterior apex release. We're going to flip the adenoma into the bladder. We are now, this is really confusing when you first do it um, as a as a learner, but that's our medial edge. We're coming back to the lateral edge. You're going to go back and forth. And one of the things we started doing, and um, it's basically named after whatever resident I'm working with. And it, right now, it's the Krieger maneuver. The Krieger maneuver is to get in and bluntly sweep uh, from lateral to medial, medial to lateral, and show that there is a uh, very little stock left on that adenoma. So we've got um, only about 12 minutes left. So I'm going to skip ahead from some of the uh, left side release and move on towards uh, more slating. But uh, this is the finishing up the second side. And as we get to more slating, uh, it's very important that you uh, carefully sequence the switch to the offset scope to Allow the passage of the morsel layer. Don't allow for any decompression. Have maximum flow. The only way we're going to save morsel is that you can see. So take that time to get your hemostasis uh, or even that morsel layer. And um, as a routine, we've now also gotten to do a little laser touch up once you've decompressed everything and you can see where some of those bleeders are. That's given us some excellent looking urine at the end of the procedure. And in fact, this guy was one of those. Uh, urine's looking nice and clear and he wound up going home that day. So that's a quick video on the technique and the time that we have. Let me just get onto a few more things. So teaching this has been the hardest thing I've ever had to learn. If hold up, it may be number two. Um, and 
it's been definitely trial and error. Um, but, you know, uh, Dan took the time with me and I have made a point of trying to um, figure out the best way to get the residents as ready as possible and fellows. Um, the, the early steps are about scope handling, uh, hemostasis, and in particular how that laser and tissue interact and what distance is appropriate. There's a lot of uh, spinning around and keeping the camera level, and those are a lot of the early coaching uh, suggestions that I'll make. But eventually, you start to do more, and I'll set them up with a with a first incision, and they'll work on the first side. Eventually, they'll start to turn into the anterior space. They'll release the apex, and finally, it's one of the last things we move toward. Excuse me, move towards is starting the case. And at that point, once they once they can start it, it's off to the races and doing a full case. Jordan did a couple of them all on her own on on Monday, just uh, just a few days ago, all the way through. And I'll just end my uh, presentation with maybe my favorite slide. But this is uh, these are uh, screenshots up here from Brian Sninsky with his times on the bottom there left. That's Gray Roberge from New Mexico. And on the right is Dr. Becky Gerber from uh, Charlotte and everybody uh, that wants to uh, and took the time to to uh, work with us um, at Meritor and UW is out there successfully hold up and that's uh, something we're really proud of. So happy to take any questions you have. Uh, that's my presentation for today. Um, this is Reg. Yeah, Reg, good morning. Good morning. Great presentation. Thank you very much. A couple of quick things. Uh, in the years gone by in the 80s, when I was a resident, about a third of income of urologists came from doing TERPs and managing BPH. And the urologists wanted to preserve their income flow. So they testified in Washington that uh, to be proficient in a TERP took 80 cases. So this 30 to 50 case issue is not a new thing, and that might be emphasized. Um, I wonder, I haven't read it in years, but Peter Gilling had, I think it was a 10 step, here's how I do a holip. And I wonder if yours is similar, the same, different. And the last comment, uh, open prostatectomy, which of course has aptly been replaced by HOLUP, involved a finger fracture at the six o'clock position and a rapid finger enucleation along the capsule. It actually took minutes, three minutes, five minutes. And the issue with bleeding was that from your angle up above from the open angle, you couldn't really see the bleeders like you could with a scope. So the, the point of bringing this up is, I wonder if anyone has explored the possibility of uh, devising or, or changing an instrument so that instead of the laser, you could just use pressure to develop the capsule very quickly. Those three things, thanks. No, oh, great comments. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Reg. I think the um, what I'll say about I, I don't know if I've come across Gilling's paper. I saw a lot of what Gilling wrote, but I didn't come across anything about a stepwise approach. So I'll have to definitely take a look and see if I can find that and, and cross reference with what we're doing. The comment about the the novel instrumentation. Um, you know, we've we a, a open simple is a very quick, efficient case. You, you I remember doing them with you. And I remember also just w wondering what happened because uh, it was over before we knew it. Um, the uh, so that 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 um, I'm not sure how to go about exploring that equipment suggestion though is you know the I know though that it's super easy to get when you've got the scope in extra capsular um, and. Most of what we spend time on as residents are gaining the skills is is don't do that because especially when you transition to a morselation, you don't want to have massive extracapsular extravasation because then the bladder can't distend in the with the if the extraperitoneal space is full of fluid that you just let extravasate the entire time you tried to finish enucleating. So um the that's a piece of this that um 
is um, wouldn't be part of an open surgery and a nucleation is the fluid. Um, but if you're short, if you're quick, if you can make it fast, then the fluid's less of an issue. So I'll have to think about how we might investigate that that equipment piece. Yeah, hey, Chris. Uh, oh. oh, sorry, Brian. I, I'll I'll just go quick and. Yeah, yeah. Chris, great uh, lecture. Not good. And um, I had a. My question is what. What complication, do you fear the most, and and any tips? Oh, that's a good one. Um, a bladder injury with a Morse later. Um, most of the second half of the case. Um, now we, the. Uh, is about setting that up to win with hemostasis after nucleation is complete and that ascent, that very important transition from nucleation to morselation where you don't want the bladder to decompress. And so I definitely helicopter parent as we're, we're going through that um, transition with the trainees um, because it's, it, it has to be fast. You don't want the decompression to allow for bleeding. And if you can't see, you can't morselate safely. And the last thing you want is to have to bail and um, come back another day because the bleeding is significant or open to try to get the the, cysto uh, the adenoma out with the cystotomy. So I think the complication I fear the most is, is bladder injury. And a lot of the steps we take are to uh, mitigate that risk as much as we can. At residence will attest, I'm always asking what's our fluid like because you know, you've got different staff in the room every day and you, you don't go through fluid quickly when you're morselating, but if it's a really long morselation, then there's certainly a risk of running out of fluid. And if the bladder decompresses, that's gonna be a risk for bladder injury. But um, thankfully we haven't, I've got three of them today. So uh, thankfully we haven't had an injury, any kind of catastrophic injury. There was a small one early in our experience that was managed with um, just catheter drainage for a few extra days, but that's what I scared about the most. Ryan, you were going to say something. Uh, yeah. Hey, Chris. Uh, yeah, great, great presentation. Um, I guess uh, mine is maybe a little co a combination of both Steve Nakata's comment and uh, Reg Bruskowitz. But uh, so with the places that have both holep and aquablation. So this is so to the residents, aquablation is the uh, robotic uh, use of high pressure water to um, you know treat the prostate. Uh, they tend to find that they tend to do more aquablation, and I don't know if it's to recoup the cost of investing in that robot, but, you know, it, it overcomes many of the hurdles that you described, right? So finding that, you know, that because the whole app, essentially, you're using the laser to develop that plane, but what actually treats the tissue, what actually is eliminating the tissue is the morselator, right? I mean, you're just pushing the prostate in, and with the you know, aquablation, you basically just draw on an image, the, you know, the plane that you want, you know, between, I yeah. mean, you have live transrectal ultrasound, you've been mentioned, you know, optimize, you know, uh, use of imaging, you basically mark where you want the tissue removed, and then it just does it in four minutes. You know, is that, you know, if you compare these head to head, is that the future where basically anybody, you know, could be doing it without, um, you know, without needing, and the reason why I said it, it integrates to Kata's comments is one of the deficiencies of it is it doesn't treat anterior tissue. It only right. treats posterior tissue. So if that anterior tissue is critical, that could be a huge uh, advantage of whole up. So great. No, I'm really glad you brought up aquablation um, because it's really attractive to a lot of urologists, especially when you compare its ability to do medium and large glands and early data. I think the bleeding is a reflex reaction for many for good reason that the you have the pie in the sky early data from the company and then there's the real world data that um, I think Dan just sent, Gronlin just sent me a screenshot of a slide the other day looking at a, a, a high transfusion rate. So what I'll the comments I'll make about aquablation is that it's it's compelling technology. 
Um, I did happen to see a live case just a few weeks ago, and I watched those water jets bounce off the median lobe, and they had to try four times to get the jets to work on like a national demonstration that I'm sure was very embarrassing that was just not touching this median lobe for whatever reason, just the density of the tissue, the fact that it was bouncing away from the jets. But these guys, they finish with a bipolar. And when I ask about anterior, they're like, well, if you think there's a lot, you can go in and resect it. And so you're debulking with the aquablation robot. And then you go in and finish because hemostasis is a problem. It's contraindicated in men who are on antiplatelet or anticoagulation. Um, no, so you, you've, is there a one side, is there one procedure that can really do everything? It may be whole up. Aquablation can't do everything. And I'm yet to find that whole upper that is, is actually, now there's, it, there's, there's a group in Canada, this guy does a little bit of everything. And he's publishing on aquablation and comparing it to whole up and other techniques. And there's always going to be people that will say those things, but I, I don't know. I, I don't have a compelling reason to try aquablation because we can do whole up. Yeah, it just seems like that the, you know, the biggest is, is it worth buying a big robot machine that only does one operation? Whereas whole up is really, it's a smaller investment, right? The, the laser does multiple things that we do in urology. It's not uh, as big an investment. And, and so it seems like the people that really have access to both technologies, you know, tend, tend to do, you know, uh, more, more aquablation and at least. I don't know. So some of the people down in Chicago are doing a higher volume. They are like, yeah, I really don't see that bleeding occur as much as people make it out to be. Because yeah. the people complain about it, usually people don't have access to it and do it routinely. So right. that's. Yeah, single use equipment um, can be tough to justify today. But it wouldn't be the first time. I know we're running short on time and we're going to turn things over to Dr. Benway in just a moment, but a, a terrific presentation really. Dr. Nakad did uh, have a, a question comment and it was kind of along lines with what I was thinking as well. Dr. Nakata wrote in the chat, is there any evidence that anterior tissue are critical to Euroflow improvement? And my, my comment on, on that was going to be, uh, you know, you, you showed some nice pictures of like what the post turf MRI looked like and you know, sure, we, we resect a lot with the TERP posteriorly because ergonomically it's easier to access that as opposed to going uh, up to the you know, 10 to 2 o'clock position anteriorly. But, um, but that, that, my, my comment was going to be as you're doing these 3D models, um, you know, maybe that is something you look at uh, after you do these enucleations, kind of like a pre and post uh, 3D modeling uh, to see you know, what, what tissue you're removing. Um, but but to go back to Dr. Nakata's comment, you know, maybe when we do the tr more traditional uh, resections, maybe we should be focusing uh, on the anterior tissue more. Is there, is there any evidence uh, that the anterior tissue is critical, as Dr. Nakata asked? I think that the imaging for BPH is uh, historically limited preoperatively. Um, so I can't speak to um, off the top of my head, off the top of my head, available data about the relationship of anterior to objective neural flow improvement. But it is, um, uh, I'd, I'd have to think about how you, you begin to design that that study. Um, what we see though is superior uh, durability and superior uh, restoration of spontaneous voiding. And we know that the unique approach to hold up gets it all out. And that's um, an inference that many of us hold uppers make, but um, the data has to be borne out. All right, well, listen, great session.